Hey guys, what's up? It's CS back here with another installment, and here's my review for Strike Force Rousey vs. Kaufman. Alright, on paper there was a bunch of mismatches initially, and it ended up playing out like so. Yeah, a bunch of, you know, UFC slash actual Strike Force level guys versus not even challengers level guys. So yeah, we had that in Safadine versus Bowling, we had that in uh, Ovin St. Pru versus TJ Cook. We had that in Souza Brunson. Yeah, not a good look if you ask me, but, you know, at least they did what they were supposed to do, in my opinion. So props to those guys. But yeah, let's just talk about Ronda Rousey versus Sarah Kaufman in the main event for that Women's Bantamweight Championship, because that's what y'all want to hear about. But first off, Sarah Kaufman did not get caught in anything. You know, she just got owned. Ronda Rousey basically went in there, executed, that was it, in less than a minute. Nasty stuff. You know, Ronda Rousey showed improved ability of closing distance with her strikes. You know, why not push the pace against Sarah Kaufman? You know, Sarah Kaufman's not exactly uh, the kind of girl who likes backing up and counter-striking, you know. Kaufman likes to stalk her opponents, land her power shots, if not take them down and, you know, land some ground and pound or work for a submission after. You know, Kaufman's that kind of girl, you know, she's just, um, you know, a moving forward kind of fighter. And... There's nothing wrong with that. She's a fairly exciting fighter. I'm a fan of Sarah Kaufman. It's just a really bad stylistic matchup um, for her against Ronda Rousey. Ronda's more athletic and Ronda's hyper-aggressive style versus Sarah Kaufman's I gotta slow this shit down kind of style. It's just not a good look for Sarah Kaufman. Ronda Rousey's gonna come in there and move forward um, before Sarah Kaufman's able to get her stalking game on with her power shots. So Ronda Rousey just threw a flurry, backed Sarah Kaufman up against the cage. Once you make Sarah Kaufman back up, then you must be doing something right. Um, especially if you're Ronda Rousey and you're with her by the cage, executing with your judo. You know, it was just an easy fight for Ronda after that. You know, it was just a matter of time before it hit the ground. Ronda adjusted for a takedown and got the um, trip. Once it was there, you know, Ronda pretty much mounted Sarah Kaufman and then went for that armbar. I was like, already? Really? And what can I say? She had to adjust for her twice. Sarah Kaufman tried to fold Ronda up like an accordion and just somehow slip out. Of course, that's what you're supposed to kind of do. Um, you know, just have the other fighter lose their risk control. But Ronda's not going to let go of that. She's too smart. This is all she does. You know, she ain't going to let go of that shit. So once she has a hold of your arm, you might as well just tap right there because you're not transitioning out of that. Um, actually, Misha Tate did, so props to that girl. But, um, she, yeah, what could I say? Um, I was like, she ain't gonna let go of that, and she didn't. So, nice win for Ronda Rousey. Nice way to adjust for that arm bar. Eventually, was able to just hyperextend Sarah Kaufman's arm. Really nasty shit. Sarah Kaufman's a very good fighter. And Sarah Kaufman probably beats um, all the 135 mainstays besides her. So, yeah, in my opinion, she just beat the number two in the world. So, what's next for Ronda Rousey? I don't know. Really, the only care, fight I care about um, for Ronda is uh, Christiane Cyborg Santos, but of course she's on leave because of her uh, suspension, so who knows if that is going to take place in the future. Cyborg said she would entertain the idea of moving down to 135. I'd like to see that. I don't think Ronda should have to move up and wait um, to fight her. Ronda is the champion. That champion should come to her. I'm pretty sure Cyborg's title was stripped, so yeah. The champion is Ronda Rousey. And 135 is the division we care about. So, yeah. Please move down, Cyborg, when you come back. If not, some bitch step up to play it against Ronda Rousey. She is a tough girl. Very exciting fighter. I want to see someone make a fight with her, um, you know, that's entertaining on both sides. Besides her just, you know, breaking her arm. But in the end, shoutouts go to Howdy Honda Housey for making it look simple against Sarah Cotton. And shoutouts go to Surfer Ken as well. But now let's move on to the co-main event middleweight bout between Ronaldo Jacare Souza and Derek Brunson. I hesitated there for a minute because I took a look at the box score and yeah, Jacare, 41 second knockout. Yeah, I forgot that shit was uh, you know, not as long as Ronda Rousey's win. Damn. Jacare by KO within a minute, faster than Ronda Rousey as well. Nicely done by Jacare. Definitely wouldn't be able to do this two or three years ago. Uh, not even last year for sure. Clearly those um, Black House hours that he's been putting in have been paying off by just looking at this fight. You know, Derek Brunson's not anything to be wowed at in terms of his striking. He came in there right at Vader-like and just fucking, you know, 
threw some sort of overhand cross or some shit and got countered by a straight. And uh, Jacques Carré, you know, pounced on him with some more strikes after Derek Brunson decided not to go down completely. So, yeah, uh, Jacques Carré for the win. Nicely done. Uh, maybe uh, with this improved striking, we might even see him set up a takedown better against Luke Rockhold if that rematch ever happens. Who knows? I still think he takes an L in that fight. Yeah, that topic is for some other time, but now let's just move on to the welterweight match between Tarek Safdie and Roger Bowling. Oh yeah, shout out to go to Chuck Ray Souza for a nice win in the end. But yeah, Tarek Safdie, Roger Bowling, um, yeah, Safdie beating up uh, Roger Bowling with uh, combinations, some body shots, and uh, a lot of light kicks, um, nasty light kicks. Uh, Roger Bowling's uh, movement was limited. Come to third round, you know, he wasn't gripping his, you know, hooks as well as he was earlier in the fight. Um, he was already losing round three, and then once he tried to go for that takedown and got his back taken instead, you know, that pretty much sealed the deal for Tarek Safdin. Safdin was pretty much uh, getting the 10 nines in the first two rounds, in my opinion. They were close, but I thought Safdin's more, um, more, um, bounce striking got that. Uh, Roger Bowling was throwing a lot of hooks, and he had some nasty leg kicks himself, but those hooks weren't connecting as well as they should have. Safdin was doing a lot of this, that's why you're hearing some contact, but, you know, really, if you take a look at Safdin's face, he never got caught square with one of those Roger Bowling um, hooks, in my opinion. Safdin looked pretty fresh after the uh, the fight, so, yeah, props to Safdin for uh, being able to cover up and, you know, just do what he did to Roger Bowling, um, because Roger Bowling, you know, he is a solid athlete, he is pretty explosive, um, really, technically, I don't think because he's great anywhere, but... You know, uh, for Safdin to just school him for three rounds, you know, I thought he schooled him for three rounds. You know, I thought I think it's a good win, um, especially after what well, we saw out of Safdin in the Tyler Stinson fight where he didn't look very good. So what's next for Safdin? Um, not sure. You know what? Um, taking a look at his frame, if he wants that fight with Nate Marquardt, Nate Marquardt's bigger. I even think Nate Marquardt's faster. In uh, welterweight, I think he's better than Safdin technically everywhere that Safdin's good at as well. So I think Safdin takes a major L if he takes that title fight against um, Nate Marquardt. What I want to see Tarek Safdin do, uh, I think he's small enough to do so, is move down to lightweight. You know, we don't want to see Pat Healy versus Gilbert Melendez. I think Safdin might give Gilbert a run for his money. And I'm being completely serious about this. I wouldn't mind seeing Safdin move down to lightweight. You know, take a look at his uh, build again. Kind of remind, reminded me of uh, Rick Hahn in Bellator. And he's able to cut down to um, 155 just fine. I think Safdin could. I'm just saying. That's just, uh, you know, something I had in my head. Especially when um, it doesn't look like Gilbert's moving to the UFC anytime soon. Put some new blood in that lightweight division. I think Tarek Safdin might be that guy. You can tell me what you think of that idea in the comment section below. But now let's move on to that Lumumba Sayers versus Anthony Smith. About, yeah, fucking missed it. Anthony Smith via triangle. La Mama must have screwed up from just looking at that. Yeah, I don't know. You guys want to tell me what happened? Tell me in the comment section below. Next up, light heavyweight bout that kicked off the main card between Ovin St. Pru and TJ Cook. Now, I did not miss this one. Ovin St. Pru came pretty close to finishing the fight in the first and second round, but since he is not that technically gifted and he kind of gasses, that's why he wasn't able to finish the fight even against a TJ Cook. I took OSP to uh, nearly finish TJ Cook here and there and not be able to just win a unanimous decision. That's why I said in my uh, prediction video. But Owen St. Pru actually was able to hit TJ Cook square enough in the face come round three. So that was uh, a nice hook um, thrown at 20 seconds for the most part in the third round. And Cook was just laid out. He was just fast asleep. Nicely done for Owen St. Pru. I hope TJ Cook is all right though. But um, yeah, nice to see uh, St. Pru get a win like that. Um, I want to see him progress. Clearly, he's not training with the best people he could be training, and I don't think he's training as hard as he could. You know, he's a hell of an athlete. The guy used to play football and shit. And uh, this is what happens when guys like this, who aren't even technically gifted, uh, fight, you know, guys who might be a little technically gifted and have been doing this, you know, just as long, if not longer. 
um, you know, just the better athlete wins. So I like, I'd like to see more athletes hit MMA like Ovin St. Pru, but of course, um, use the same diligence as like a George St. Pierre or uh, John Jones, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, hopefully we see some of these kind of guys in the future. But now let's move on to the undercard on Showtime Extreme headlined by Misha Tate and Julie Kedzie, also in Bantamweight. Yeah, uh, those girls brought it. Um, that was pretty fun to watch. You know, Julie Kedzie, you know, props to that girl for throwing down, being able to keep it on her feet for a while up until, you know, it just went to the ground and it was Misha's world, you know. Um, Misha Tate, uh, of course, in the first round, really didn't look good with her own striking. Uh, Kedzie was uh, employing a really good, strong brawl game plan using that um, Mike Winkle John uh, striking, you know, being able to rip some leg kicks and uh, some nice punch combinations. Uh, Misha was just not in it come round one. Come round two, though, Misha was able to get some of her grappling off. It just somehow hit the ground. Nicely done by Misha Tate there, and nice uh, defense employed by Julie Kedzie not getting submitted there, but you know, come round three, uh, Misha was able to recover from a really nasty head kick, like shin to the face, and um, yeah, Kedzie just could not finish there. Um, Tate somehow recovered, um, you know, did some nice work from guard. Uh, yeah, transition from a triangle, eventually got the mount, and then armbar? Fuck, man, that was crazy. Uh, that was not Ronda Rousey-like, but it was still a nice armbar. Nevertheless, uh, yeah, props to Misha Tate for, um, you know, coming back. That was a scary round. Holy shit. So, yeah, um, definitely fight of the night, in my opinion. What's next for either girl? Kedzie, you know, I'm not sure who she goes up against next. Um, I know Bantamweight's pretty much a marquee division for women, but I'm not sure if there's anyone for um, Kedzie to fight in for Strike Force. I'm trying to think of names, and I can't. Maybe she takes a fight in Invicta. Who knows? Uh, as for Misha Tate, maybe the same thing because, you know, watching from what uh, I just saw there, she knows she'll get beat by Rousey again, and she knows that it was not a, you know, it wasn't a number one contender-like performance. So Misha Tate still needs another fight in order for her to get back to Ronda Rousey uh, for sure. Who knows? Uh, nice win, though. Now let's, now let's move on to the middleweight bout between Adlan Amagov and Keith Berry. Guys, um, first off, props to Adlan Amagov. This made my night. I think we should see, be seeing this uh, from more fighters. You know, it is legal. Kicking someone's knees in with a sidekick is legal. You know, if it was illegal, the, someone would have said something about it uh, right th then and there. You know, um, who is that? Herb Dean? You know, he would know if that shit's illegal. Now, you might think it's a questionable stoppage with... Um, what's his face just talking back at Herb Dean um, Herb Dean thinks he's out you know what I'm saying so I see the miscommunication there but Herb Dean definitely didn't do anything about that sidekick to the knee because you're allowed to do it um, why not hell if I was fighting someone like in MMA I'd be doing that a lot just pissing the guy off and yeah sure you can get injured by it but um, Whose fault is that? Don't leave your fucking knees out there like that. Move laterally or something. So, yeah, Alan Amagov, very skilled striker. Um, I think he's only going to get better in uh, Mike Winklejohn and Greg Jackson's camp. His grappling, very stellar. Watch his submission wrestling videos. He's pretty solid. Uh, very solid at Sambo, of course, as well. Yeah, the guy's a very well-rounded guy. I hope he puts it all together. I want to see him in the UFC. Uh, maybe in the welterweight division because I think he might be tossed around by some of those middleweights. Just saying. Uh, now let's move on to the featherweight bout between uh, Hiroko Yamanaka and Jermaine Durandami. Yeah, uh, Jermaine Durandami was able to keep this standing. Um, Yamanaka just couldn't get this down to the ground. Yamanaka's level changes aren't very good. She should train in America full-time if she's going to fight here. Just saying. Um, Durandami training with AKA. Had I known she was training with AKA, I would have picked her. Just saying. Uh, if not uh, foreign fighter versus foreign fighter on American soil, I was going with Yamanaka based on experience. But um, the fact that Durandami was uh, training with the right people, you know, training with Daniel Cormier a lot at AKA, um, good for her. And it makes sense to why she won. Uh, now let's move on. Lightweight belt between Bobby Green and Matt Ricehouse. Bobby Green being the better Muay Thai striker, being able to keep this on the feet. Um, yeah. He won 30-27 across the board. Doesn't surprise me. But there it is, guys. That about does it for my Strike Force Rousey versus Kaufman review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Tell me what your thoughts 
are on it in the comment section below. Again, my link's in the description below as well. And stay tuned for my UFC 151 predictions, which should be up very soon. So yeah, hopefully you guys stay tuned for that. I'll see you then. So thank you for all the support. Once again, deuces for all my supporters, bruises for all my haters, and take care.